working our way through the book of Nehemiah, uh, looking at what happens before and when a revival comes. Uh, As we were looking in in chapter 1, we spent uh, three weeks there in chapter 1 looking at the uh, the need and uh, and how when Nehemiah got the news of what was going on as he was in Babylon or uh, actually uh, in uh, there in, in Persia uh, under the king there and serving the king there and heard what was going on back home and back in Israel and back in Jerusalem in particular, how his heart was broken over not only the physical condition but the spiritual condition of God's people and uh, and out of that brokenness came a time of, of, of weeping uh, on his face before the Lord and a time of prayer and fasting. That's all preparation uh, for revival and for a work of God. And so uh, we are uh, right in the middle, a little over halfway through uh, 24 days, a season of uh, fasting and prayer. And I hope that you've been participating in that. Uh, but in the midst of this, we have this reminder in Nehemiah uh, chapter 4. Now, I'm not, you saying, what about chapter 2 and 3? Uh, well, we're just kind of, we're, we're zipping past that because I want us to focus in on our chapter 4 there. In chapter 2, uh, that's where the king noticed uh, what was going on in Nehemiah's life after uh, several months of, uh, of fasting and prayer and, and, and doing that. And, uh, and so uh, Nehemiah uh, granted, uh, I mean, the king granted to Nehemiah the opportunity uh, to go back and return. And Nehemiah prayed some more. And uh, he returned with some people there. It says in Nehemiah chapter 2 that the good hand of God was on Nehemiah. That's what we need, not the hand of judgment. Uh, the hand, the good hand of, of God upon us. But understand this, when Nehemiah got back to Jerusalem and began investigating what was going on, the enemy got stirred up. Uh, the enemy got stirred up. And then in chapter 3, uh, we see how the work begins there. The work starts there, and it has this list of all these people that were, were working there. But because as you look at that list, and I don't know who they were, I can't pronounce half their names, uh, and, and you can't either and stuff. But understand this, as those people that are listed, God knew who they were, and he's just letting us know that these are real guys. And listen, we're real people, and real people have real issues. Let's just quit pretending, okay? Uh, We have issues, we have struggles, we have weaknesses, we have challenges, we have failures in in our life. And and so whenever you got people, you're going to deal with that. And so that's why we need revival. That's why we need the the working of God and the the reworking of God and the refreshing of God and the renewing of God. And, and, And we need that oftentimes. And so that's what's going on in chapters two and three. And so we pick up in chapter four that the enemy's got stirred up, that uh, he's beginning to act. So let's just read through uh, Nehemiah chapter four here where it says, but it so happened when Sanballat, uh, that's part of the enemy, uh, heard that we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren in the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him. They're partnering up. They're ganging up. And he said, whatever they build, if even a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. And so it doesn't say here, but in verse 4, Nehemiah immediately turns to God in prayer. And, and I'm sure at that time, as he's hearing these things, he's praying about this. But even as he's writing this, it is a recorded prayer of Nehemiah. The prayer does not stop. Verse 4, as he says, Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sin be blotted out from before you, for they provoked you to anger before the builders. So we built the wall and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height for the people had a mind to work. 
Now it happened, and this is some of that. That tells you the, the end result, but this is some of what goes on uh, in the meantime while this is going on, while the wall is, is being rebuilt, while they're, they're moving toward verse 6. It says, Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, and the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed, that they became very angry. You see, these are the people that when the Jews went into captivity, that kind of moved in and took over that land. They're the Canaanites of going back to Joshua and Moses and, and all of that. They're kind of moving back in and kind of reclaiming some of their land and, and, and they're happy with that. And now that the Jews are being allowed to come back under Ezra, and now again with Nehemiah and stuff, they don't like what's going on. So they're trying to discourage what's going on. They want, it's okay for them to come in, but just don't take our land, don't take our houses and, uh, and, and, and don't take over what's going on as long as you uh, just keep your place in doing that. So that's what's going on. It says in verse eight, it says, and all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God and because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. Then Judah said, the Jews, the people said, the strength of the labors is failing and there's so much rubbish that we're not able to build the wall. And our adversaries said, they will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. So it was when the Jews who dwelt there near um, who dwelt near them came and they told us 10 times for whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. Therefore, I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall at the opening. And I set the people according to their families with their swords, their spears and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had brought their plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall, everyone to his work. So it was from that time on that half of my servants worked at construction while the other half held the spears, the shields, the bows, and wore armor. And the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction and with the other held a weapon. Every one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built. And the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. Then I said to the nobles, the rulers, and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive and we're separated far from one another on the wall. Whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us here. Uh, rally to us there, our God will fight for us. So we labored in the work and half the men held the spears from daybreak until the stars appeared. At the same time, I also said to the people, let each man and his servant stay at night in Jerusalem that they may be our guard by night and a working party by day. So neither I, my brethren, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me took off our clothes, except that everyone took them off for washing. And the work continued. The work continued. Let me ask you this. Have you gotten the enemy's attention lately? I think we as a church are starting to get the enemy's attention. Here the enemy rises up against Nehemiah. I told you the groups that were there led by Samballat. Samballat was uh, uh, from uh, the area of Samaria there. It says uh, that he was a, a Canaanite. He was a Persian leader that, that Persia put over that area. There's Tobiah uh, who was an, an Ammonite that was there. Uh, these are the leaders over Jerusalem when the Jews start coming back and they don't like what's, what's going on. They, they, they're going to lose out. They're going to lose their power. They're going to lose their property and all these things. And so they're working and, and, and they are moving. And by the way, our enemy is working and moving. I don't, I don't know where you are uh, spiritually or where you are in your understanding of the Bible, but the Bible makes it very clear that there are spiritual beings that are working against us. 
Uh, we can't see them. We can see what they do, but we don't, all, we don't see them, but we, we see their, their, their work. And the Bible makes it very clear that the devil is real and his demons are real. There are these spiritual beings that are working against God, working against the people of God. The Bible says it. Jesus said they were real. Matter of fact, Jesus set people free from the work of the devil and from the possession of, of, of demons here. And I ain't got time to go into to all of that, but let me just say the Bible says they are real real. And if you don't believe they're real, then the enemy has you deceived and he's already won in your life. We need to recognize that. We need to recognize that they are real and they are acting because whenever God begins to move, the enemy begins to move. And when there's any revival of God's people, there's also going to be with that a revival of God's enemy. He's going to get his attention. And he's going to begin to work. He's working all the time, but, but he begins to really focus his work when we begin to, to walk with God and live a life that, that contradicts and that resists the work of the enemy. So let's talk just a little bit this morning about the, the enemy of God. We're going to talk about three groups that we see in here. We see the enemy of God, we see God himself, and we see the people of God. So let's look first of all at the, the enemy of God. And there's, there's a lot of truths about the enemy that we could talk about, but there's three truths I, I think God wants us to focus in on and understand this about the enemy. First of all, the enemy passionately hates us. Understand that. The enemy is not on your side. The enemy passionately hates us. Look back in verse 1 as, as the enemy is described here. It says, for it so happened when Samballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall. What's the problem with rebuilding the wall? They're not doing anything to him, but he hears this, that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren in the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? They couldn't be used again. How can they do this? And then here comes Tobiah, the Ammonite, that was beside him. And he said, whatever they build, if even a fox goes up on him, he'll break down the stone wall. It won't last. And so here they come and they're, they're, they're working. Oftentimes we, we think that the, we have this idea that the enemy is our friend and that when the enemy tempts us, that he's wanting us to enjoy life and to have some pleasure and to have some ease or some comfort. That is not what he is about. The enemy is not our friend. I remember when I was uh, doing jail ministry back when I was, I was going to seminary and, uh, and, and talking to, and, and there were folks there. You know, when you go and do jail ministry, you got folks that are genuinely broken over what they've done and, and God's dealing with. You got others that are, are, are con folks and they're still trying to, uh, to con you out of things. They're trying to tell you what you want and so they can get out of you what uh, they want whenever they want that. And then you got others that are hardened and resistant. And I was doing it one, uh, one Wednesday and I was, I was sharing with them and there's one guy that came in there and he was one of those hardened guys. And he, I, I, as I began uh, sharing with them and teaching from the Bible, he interrupted me and he said, me and the devil got a deal. He said, the devil's going to throw one big party and I'm going to be at the head of the table and uh, leading that party. It's going to be a great time when I, when I, I get to hell with the devil. And then I just simply said, well, you know the devil's a liar. He is. There is no party in hell. And if you join his side, then you get his reward. And there's no reward to it. See, understand this. The enemy cannot bless us. The enemy cannot bless us. And not only can he not bless us, he doesn't want to bless us. He passionately hates us. It, it uses the word here of, 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 of Nehemiah and the people of God's enemy that says they were furious. What, what, the word furious means they were glowing. They were red hot. What do they have to be mad about? I mean, they're just following God. They're rebuilding the walls of, of Jerusalem there. But just because they're, they're doing anything for God and obeying God in any way, they're furious about it. It says they were indignant uh, uh, about it. They were very indignant. That word indignant means that they were just irritated the smithereens. They just, everything the Jews did just irritated them. Why? Because they hated them. 
They hated them. And that's the way the enemy is. He passionately hates us. Everything about the people of God irritates and provokes the enemy. He doesn't like us because he doesn't like him. He hates God. He envies God. He detests God. And he knows where his destiny is and the lake of fire separated forever apart from God and a place of torture and torment. And he hates God and he hates everyone that escapes that through the grace of God. You want to really irritate the enemy? No. <laughs> you want to really irritate the enemy? Start praying and fasting for revival. He passionately hates us. Not only that, but he also, he actively attacks us. He actively attacks us. It says back there in, in verse 1 that not only was he furious and very indignant, but he mocked the Jews. And we read some of the things that he says there. And then look over in, in verse 7. It says, here's the same one. It says, now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, and the Arabs and the Ammonites, they got a big group together. And the Ashdodites uh, heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed. That they became very angry. That's that, that idea of hot, boiling over mad. And it says, and all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Matter of fact, a little bit later on, they said, we're going to come in there and kill you is what we're going to do. So the enemy actively attacked. He's just not mad and irritated us. He moves and he works around us. See, the, the enemy wants to destroy us. Understand that I'm surprised the power hadn't gone out yet or the internet gone out uh, for those online. Because he does, he wants to destroy, he, 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 he tries to distract us, but he tries to distract us to move us away from God and destroy us. Here the enemy speaks and mocks. And the idea of, of, of mocking is that he's, he's making fun of the, the language. Uh, that's what the word literally means. It means to to mock the language, to kind of like somebody says something, you go, mew, 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 you know, that type of thing is, is, is what they're doing. But this, that's one of the things I've noticed about the enemy. The enemy mocks the voice of God. You remember when Adam and Eve were deceived in the garden, what did the enemy say? He says, has God really said this? And he'll do that in our lives. Does God really love you? Does God really care for you? Does God really know what's going on in your life? And he mocks the word of God. And he mocks the voice of God. Because if he can move us away from God, he can work his power of destruction in our life. He wants to destroy us. He wants to destroy our relationship with God. He wants us to, to break our fellowship with God. He wants to ruin our intimacy with God. He wants to, to move us away from God. And not only does he want to destroy our relationship with God, but he wants to destroy us. He wants to attack us. When it says there that they, in verse 8 it says, and attack Jerusalem. That word attack, yes it means to bring harm and bondage, but the root of this word, it means to cut off from life. And that's what the enemy wants to do. Now listen, he can't make you not be a child of God once you're a child of God. But he wants to do everything he can to cut you off from the life of God. And if you don't know Jesus, if you're not willing to give your life to Jesus, it's the enemy that's deceiving you into thinking you that you can have life apart from Jesus. The enemy actively attacks us. And then thirdly, the enemy deceptively plots against us. Notice in verse 8, again, that I read, it says, And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. They're conspiring. They're, they're bonding themselves together. They're binding themselves together to bind up the people of God. And that's what the enemy does as well. The enemy will use any means necessary to bring us down. 
to bring us down. He's a liar. And he's a good liar. He will lie. He will deceive. His weapons are very effective. Matter of fact, his weapons are so effective that we can't overcome them without the spiritual weapons that God has given us. We cannot. Understand this. The Bible talks about greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. But notice what that verse does not say in, in, in 1 John. It doesn't say greater are you than he that's in the world. Greater is he that's in you. Jesus is greater than him, but we're not. We are not. Don't, don't challenge the enemy. Don't try to take on the enemy by yourself. Don't move away from God. Don't, don't move outside of the, the intimacy with God and depending upon the power of God and the filling of the Spirit of God. If you do, he will bring you down. Because he can overcome you. See, he tries to distract us. And then when we give in to the distraction, then he discourages us over being distracted. We, we move away from God. We neglect our Bible. We, we don't pray. We, that opportunity to witness comes and the Holy Spirit tells us to witness and we don't do it. And then here comes the enemy because he's been distracting us and, and getting us off and stuff. And then when we give in to his distraction, he goes, why'd you do that? I can't believe you did that. You don't... God doesn't want to have anything. to do. God's disappointed in you. You better, you better go hide. Don't talk to him. He's going to spank you if you do. You're going to get a whooping if you run back to God. You better run away. And he discourages us. And then because we become discouraged, we become despair because we become discouraged. We give in to despair and I can't believe I've gotten discouraged and gotten down and I've gone a whole week without reading my Bible and I'm not serving God like I should. I tell you what, I'll just, there's no use in me going to church today. God's disappointed in me and the roof will fall down if I go today. So I just need to stay at home. And then that despair moves us further away from God and depression comes in. And we end up in a very dark place that the enemy has prepared for us. You see, he passionately hates us and he actively and effectively attacks us and he deceptively plots against us. But let's, get, let's quit talking about him. Let's talk about God because we have a God who overcomes him who is always there to overcome, regardless of what the enemy does. God is greater. Look how God is described here in these verses. Uh, first of all, he's described as the God who is able. In verse 4, we, we see uh, Nehemiah turning to God in prayer, and he says, Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to the land of captivity. As he's doing this, why is he asking God to do these things? Because God is able. He's able to do it. He's already seen the hand of work uh, in, his, in his life. He's asking God to do these things because he believes and he knows that God can. It says, uh, hear, O oh, our God. He uses the word God. And it's not by accident that, that when he's asking God to do something, he goes to the power name for God. This is the Hebrew name Elohim for God. He is the power God. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He spoke the world into existence. He has power in his voice. He has power in his words. He has power in his presence. And when God shows up and God speaks, things change. Our God is able. Hey, I, I just want to let you know, I've read the end of this book and God wins. Not only, not only does God win, but I want to let you know, I've read this book and God has already won. He has already won the victory. And the same Jesus that we read that walked in victory in the New Testament is the same Jesus that lives within us and the same Jesus that hears our prayer and the same Jesus that promised he would never leave us or forsake us. Our God is able. Not only do we have a God who is able, we have a God who 
cares. He, t- he turns to God in prayer there in verse 4. He says, hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn the reproach upon their head. Why is he, he calling out to God? Because God does hear. God does care. He cares about what is going on. And then in, in, in verse 5, he says, do not cover their iniquity. And do not let their sin be blotted out before you. For they have provoked you to the anger before the builders. And so he's he's putting all this together. He's talking about the honor of God. You see, the enemy comes in and he wants to doubt that God loves us, that God cares for us. That, But I want you to know God's already overcome the enemy. He's already won that battle. And so we need to put our focus uh, upon him. He cares for his honor and he cares for his people. He cares for his people. When it talks about there about they've provoked you, that word provoked means that they've grieved God. Why have they grieved God? Because they're coming against his people. They're moving against the people that he loves, the people that he cares for, the people that he's promised, the people that he's redeemed, that he cares for them, and he cares for us as well. And it hurts God to see his people hurting as well. And so we have a God that cares for us, that when the enemy comes against us, he is with us and he is able and he loves us and cares for us. Not only that, but we have a God who fights for us. I think you caught that when we read verse 20 when he says, wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there because our God will fight for us. It's a promise of Nehemiah. It's an Old Testament truth all throughout Scripture. When Moses was leading the people to the promised land and leading them through the wilderness. He told them time and time again, God's with you. God's with you. And he will fight for you. It's okay. He will fight for you. He will fight. And then as Joshua led the children of Israel into the promised land, that's what he said. And and, and they met the the Jesus there before he went in, told him, he said, I'm going before you. I'm going before you. And I will fight for you. It wasn't the sound of the trumpet that brought those walls down. It wasn't walking around uh, and marching around that brought the walls down. It wasn't the shout that brought the walls down. It was God that brought the walls down. That's what David understood in his life when he went and faced Goliath. He didn't go facing Goliath because he was expert at the slingshot he went and said God's going to take you down he's just going to use me to do it and so that was that's what he said he said you've you've spoken you've blasphemed the name of the Lord our God and God will give you into my hand God fights for us matter of fact even in in Psalm 23 as David's talking about the Lord is my shepherd what does he say as far as attacks as far as the enemy he says you prepare me a table in the presence of my enemies I can have fellowship with you I can walk with you I can pull up to the table and you'll fight the enemy for me and overcome the enemy that is our God He fights for us. And by the way, he's a God who overcomes. When he fights for us, he wins. Look back in verse 15 there where it says, And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had brought their plot to nothing. Then all of us returned to the wall, everyone to his work. God brought their plot to nothing. God brought the victory. He overcomes all those things. Yes, the enemy passionately hates us, but God overcomes. Yes, the enemy actively attacks us, but God overcomes. Yes, the enemy deceptively plots against us, but we have a God who overcomes overcomes everything that the enemy does. I want you to understand, sometimes we have this approach to the enemy, we act like we're Barney Five. That we got a bullet in our pocket. And here comes the enemy, go, wait a minute, let me get my bullet. And I mean, you know, and put that, no, 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 no. You're not Barney Five. you're a child of God. He fights for us. He overcomes We just need to depend upon them. I can't do this. I can't live the life of victory, but he can and he does. So let's just hide in him. Let's just walk in. Now understand when I say hide in him, I'm not talking about pulling up the handle on our recliner and just sitting back and doing nothing. I'm not talking about a life of luxury and and laziness and complacency and and sitting back and, and doing nothing. God is the one that does the work, but when he works, he moves up. 
us and, and we move and we walk with him and we obey, it, we are in a battle and we've got to be good soldiers and we've got to put our armor on and we've got to stand against the enemy. But we stand in his strength and we stand in his power and we move under his direction because he's the one that overcomes. Having said that, let's look at the people of God. What do the people of God need to do? Here's some practical things as we wrap this up this morning. Number one, guess what? Pray. Do not just check that off and move on. Pray. Pray like you've never prayed before. Go deeper in your prayer life. Connect with God in your prayer life. Depend on God in your prayer life. Hear from God in your prayer life. Pray. That's what he did back in verse 4 when he says, Hear, O our God, for we are despised. He turns to God. What did we talk about last week? If you weren't here last week, you can go online and, and, and check it out. Stuff We focused on prayer and, and, and broke it down. The word pray, one of the words for prayer is talking about that, how we need to, to, to cut down ourselves and, and where it's not us, we're depending upon him. And we need to cut out those things in our life that are interfering in our relationship with God. And we need to allow God to cut in and move in and, and take over every area of our life, living that abiding relationship. How does that happen? That happens in prayer prayer. So as we pray, we're going, going stronger with him. When he talks in Ephesians chapter six, talks about putting on the armor of Christ because we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against these principalities, against this spiritual wickedness in high places. Once we get the armor on, what do we do? He says, praying always in the spirit. And then by the way, in Luke chapter 11, when the disciples said, teach us to pray and he worked through that, that model prayer and the type of the way they ought to pray and the type of things they ought to pray for. And then he laid down this principle to them about a God who who gives and and that if if we will ask, he will give, and if we seek, he will find, we will find, and if we knock, the door will be open to us. And then he says this, he says, Understand this. The Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. That's what it says in Luke chapter 11. So every day we ought to be asking, Holy Spirit, take over my life. Work in my life. Lead my life. Empower my life. Fill my life in every way. If we're going to stand. We've got to pray. And pray over these things. Tomorrow night, we're, we gather together every Monday night right here in the sanctuary and pray. Love to see you come and have you come and be, be a, join us with that. Uh, let's pray. Focus, focus. That's number two, focus. I need to move quickly through these things and I'm slowing down. Uh, and focus, in verse 14, that's what Nehemiah reminds them. In, in verse 14, it says, And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, the leaders, the rest of the people, he said, Do not be afraid of them. He says, Remember the Lord, great and awesome. And fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. He says, remember, in other words, put it in your mind. Dwell in that relationship. Abide in this relationship. Think upon this relationship. Walk out this relationship. See, that's what fasting does is that we're taking our mind off the things of this world and we're spending time, our attention mentally, spiritually, emotionally, physically, all with God. We're putting our focus upon Him and we need to live a life like that a life of focus upon him. We need to remember him and, and put him in and let him be a part of every second of every day in our lives. Pray, focus, don't quit. Persevere, don't give up. Verse 15, it says, and it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had brought their plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall. We didn't quit. Everyone went back to work. Keep reading the word of God. Keep studying the word of God. Keep praying through the word of God. Keep worshiping God. Keep serving God. Keep depending upon God. Keep trusting in God. Keep, keep 
God in your life and, and don't quit. Do not give up. That's what the enemy wants to do because the more he moves us away from God, the easier he can move in and destroy our lives. Remember in, in verse 6, it says that they had a mind to work. Understand this, that it is not just the, the physical will or, or the, the mental will and determination, but it's a spiritual thing that was going on that as he prayed for them, God gave them a mind to work. God gave them the energy. God gave them the focus. God gave gave them the strength. God gave them the, the, the faith. It's a spiritual reality that affected the way that they acted and how they behave. And God will do that as well. Do not quit. Trust the Lord. If all. And then uh, number four, team up. Team up. Don't try to do it alone. No lone rangers in the kingdom of God. Verse 19, he said there, it says, Then I said to the nobles, the rulers, and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive, and we're separated far from one another on the wall. So whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Now God will fight for us. And he brought them together, not because there was a battle at that moment, but because of what might come. And says, this is the result. Verse 21, so we labored in the work. Half of the men held the spears from daybreak until the stars appeared. And at the same time, Time, I also said to the people, let each man and his servant stay at night in Jerusalem that they might be our guard by night and working, uh, a working party by day. And so here they are working together. Some are working, others are guarding. Then those work and the others guard. Back and forth. They, they, you need to find somebody that's got your back. All the armor is on the front. There's no back plug. There's a breastplate, there's a shield, there's a helmet, there's all these things that we're supposed to put on. There's no backplate. Why? Because we're supposed to cover each other's back. We're supposed to cover each other's back. Find somebody that's got your back. Give somebody permission to speak into your life and, 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 and not just to, to criticize what's going on in your life, but to, to, to help you to, to follow after God. Find somebody. Like, that's what our Sunday school classes ought to be. It ought to be us teaming up together every Sunday to encourage one another, to help one another. And by the way, I encourage you Sunday school classes to, to take some extra time. You meet every Sunday, maybe, hopefully maybe once some months to just get together outside of your normal Sunday morning just to pray together and pray for revival at Underwood Baptist Church. Team up and then finally stay alert. That's what he was talking about in verse 22 where he said night and day. A guard by night and a working party by day. And then verse 23 he says, so neither I, my brethren, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me took off our clothes, except that everyone took them off for washing. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what he's saying is they stayed ready. They stayed alert day and night. The enemy never stops. We can never stop. Stay alert. Stay in the Word. Stay dependent upon the Holy Spirit. Be vigilant. Be awake. Be aware. Be abiding. This is what we need to do.